welcome to the Money and the Muse Lecture 4. Today we are talking about taste. We've added culture, power, the state, the public sphere, the place of the stage, to our toolbox. And today we are adding taste. Taste is really about what we think is good and bad culture, good and bad art, mass culture, folk culture, high culture. These are all categories that are not objective. Rather, they're created and they carry a certain value. And this leads to cultural hierarchy, how we understand what is good and what is bad and what are the consequences of that hierarchy. So let's explore this briefly. If you're in a class, find a partner. If you're at home, call a friend or a relative. I'm serious, really do that. This is very interesting. Ask them a few questions. First, what is their favorite cultural product, their favorite film, their favorite movie ever, their favorite song they just love rocking out to? What is it? What do they think should never have been produced? What film do they hate, right? What is their least favorite song? And finally, and most interestingly, what is their guilty pleasure? What is the TV show they really love watching but they really don't want anyone to know they watch? Or the music they listen to quietly at home or that they sing in the shower and like hope no one's listening? So interview them, ask them these questions, love, hate, guilty pleasure, and then think about what do those three questions tell you? What did you just learn about that person? What did you just learn about that friend, that coworker, that relative from these questions about their taste? Immediately, these questions give you a sense of their idea of a cultural hierarchy, what is good and what is bad culture. So for example, I'm interviewing myself. So um, I study theater. I used to be an actress. So uh, when I was young, we went as a family to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival every summer. So a lot of my ideas about what is good theater come from these summers at this Shakespeare Festival. And indeed, I would recall one moment in uh, a production of Peer Gynt by Henrik Ibsen, and this moment where this one actor, Rex Raybould, who died soon after, several years after this um, experience, it's a scene where he's maybe playing death and he's in a boat and Pierre says, what are you doing? And he says, I am being silent. It sounds like a tiny moment, but the way the actor conveyed, I am being silent was breathtaking. The entire theater looked at the stage. It was a beautiful moment. And it was a moment that just captured that kind of community and coming together that can happen with, mag with the magic of theater, right? So that's one of my favorite cultural moments. There's a lot I could talk about, but, but I'll just give you one. What never should have been produced? Okay, well, what comes to mind first is um, that recent movie of Cats, the musical. No disrespect to the actors intended, but wow. Um, my guilty pleasure, Nordic Noir. If it's about crime and takes place in Scandinavia in the snow, I'm probably watching it at 10 p.m. at night when I should be doing other things. What might that tell you? Um, it tells you quite a bit. I have this idea that people who are professors should be you know, reading Hegel at night in the original German, and yet I'm watching Nordic Noir. So that tells you that I had this idea of what is good. What is good is to read really difficult, dense texts in the original language. That's good culture, right? Bad culture is crime dramas. And somehow that's what I feel guilty about watching. For someone else, they might have very different answers to those questions. And that would, again, tell you something different about their cultural hierarchy. And what you'll see is there's no ob objectivity. Right? One person's guilty pleasure might be another person's favorite cultural object. But we see certain structures behind these choices, certain ideas of what things should be, what you should like, what you should want to do, right? and what you actually do, and what you actually enjoy doing. Right? That's what this is about. That's what taste is about. So let's turn to the text for today, Pierre Bourdieu. We start with the usual. Who is he? When is he? Where is he? Again, we have another French intellectual. 
So let's start with distinction. And I am going to walk you through this text a bit. Unlike with Habermas, we're going to linger on this text because there's so many gems here. So on the very first page, we have this quote. Cultural needs are the product of upbringing and education. Surveys establish that all cultural practices, museum visits, concert going, reading, etc., and preferences in literature, painting, or music are closely linked to educational level, measured by qualifications or length of schooling, and secondarily to social origin. This predisposes tastes to function as markers of class. In other words, if you grew up going to the theater, you might like theater. If you grew up going to the symphony, you might like the symphony. If you grew up with your parents reading a lot of literature to you, you're probably someone who reads, right? Um, and so there's a connection between your taste and how you grew up and where you grew up. You could find exceptions to this. Um, an interesting point might be, say, Prof. Sayu's outings to the theater, right? Or school trips to museum. If you, if you went to a school that mandated trips to museums, you might like museums regardless of whether your parents took you or not. In other words, there might be cases where we see a less direct connection between taste and class than Bourdieu's outlining here, but we might not, right? And the point is that, again, there's no objective good or bad culture. It's just what you grew up with. What you, did you grow up going to the museum? Did you grow up going to the theater, etc.? He explains the larger point. A work of art has meaning and interest only for someone who possesses the cultural competence, that is, the code, into which it is encoded. So someone who possesses the code, right? So if you look at, say, a Jackson Pollock painting, right, all the splatters of paint everywhere, or Malevich's black square, you might not appreciate it simply because you don't understand it. And art, it seems, as Bourdieu is saying, must be understood. You must be able to read the artwork. And think about this. You might hear it all the time in different contexts, right? Um, I don't like Shakespeare because I don't understand it, right? I don't like XYZ because I don't get it, right? I don't like abstract art because I want art that has a picture on it, right? Or that, that I can understand. I don't understand it. In footnote four, it's funny that a big point is in the footnote, but that's true for Bourdieu. He says, it will be seen that this internalized code, right, the ability to read the painting or read the text, called culture, functions as cultural capital owing to the fact that being unequally distributed, it secures profits of distinction. This is actually the big argument in the text. The internalized code called culture, whether we can read paintings or theater productions or understand music, functions as cultural capital. It's capital for us. It's something we can deploy, we can pay with, we can use because it's unequally distributed and it secures profits of distinction. Cultural capital. That may be a term that you've actually used before or you've, you've seen before. You might sort of um, empirically, intrinsically know what it means. It means if you know something about something, it's like you have a certain authority, right? Cultural capital, cultural competence, right? I know something about theater and that gives me a certain sense of authority in certain milieus, right? Put cultural capital into your toolboxes right now. It's huge. It's a different take on Foucault's power knowledge, actually, right? Um, he's talking about how a kind of knowledge um, gives you a kind of capital, right? It's not uh, force or violence or, or power. It's not Marxist capital like money. It's cultural capital, but it's capital nonetheless. Let's go deeper. He then describes more of what he's talking about with these cultural codes. He says, an art which, like all post-impressionist painting, is the product of an artistic intention which asserts the primacy of the mode of representation over the object of representation, demands categorically an attention to form which previous art only demanded conditionally. Okay, that's a lot. What does that mean? So he's also getting into the weeds on art history here. And some of my art historian colleagues might disagree with some of Bourdieu's analysis of post-impressionist art. But um, essentially, um, let me give an example. For example, in 
dentist offices in the United States, and I'm sure there's an equivalent elsewhere in the world, you might have posters of, for example, Monet's water lilies. They're very relaxing, right? Or Renoir, right? Um, a beautiful French girl sitting in a garden. These are paintings where you get it because it's, it's pretty nature and it's, and it's pretty people, and you can kind of understand it. There's probably a lot more that one could understand if one were an expert on Monet, right? You'd really understand the texture of the paint and how he painted the water lilies and the full context there. But the point is, for kind of the basic general observer, we see pretty water lilies, we see pretty girls, we get the painting, right? And that's very different than abstract art, which doesn't immediately tell a story, right? Which doesn't really look like real people, right? which is abstract, which is different. And Bourdieu is saying that needs a kind of code, it needs a kind of understanding to be able to get it, right? And you can think about that with a lot of different art, right? Um, literature that's just about plot, right? Who, who, who committed the crime, right? Is the guy gonna get the girl at the end of the book, right? Versus literature that's really about form, that might not have a plot, um, that's about playing with language in a different way. That might take a kind of code, a kind of understanding, a kind of sense of taste to be able to understand and enjoy, right? Or theater, right? Um, whether you like theater, that's a melodrama. What's going to happen in the play? Is she going to die? Is, is she going to pick this guy or that guy? What's going to happen at the end of the play versus a play that might have no plot? Right? That might be more about the construction of acting, or the kind of acting, or um, the kind of set, right? or the relationship between the body and the set. That's a very different kind of cultural product. And Bourdieu's, frankly, in my opinion here, being a bit elitist, because he's talking about how working class audiences want plot and entertainment, and more refined and educated people want more. We can judge him, and we probably should, but we can see these ideas across time and space, these ideas of taste and what you like and what you enjoy, meaning something more than just that you like that kind of music or that kind of art. In my class, I often assign the 1956 film Spring on Zarechnaya Street. It's a very Soviet film about the thaw, filmed in Zaporizhia and at Odessa Film Studios. And the conceit is that this young post-war female teacher comes to essentially Zaporizhia. Um, she likes Pushkin. She likes Russian literature. She likes on a weekend night to listen to the radio where they play the classical music. And the idea is that she, that puts her in conflict and indeed in love with Sasha, the worker who's one of her students, who of course doesn't know anything about Pushkin or Russian literature and doesn't really appreciate classical music. And there's a wonderful scene in the movie where she's listening, just entranced to the music from the radio, and Sasha realizes he can't connect with her, and he walks out the room. Ultimately, they sort of get together in a very ambiguous way. Um, but the point is that these concepts of taste actually connect with status, where you're from, with class, and in this film with a sense of your place in Soviet society, right? So it's not just about classical music is good, it's that her liking classical music tells us something about her character, right? And who she is and what her place is in this post-war Soviet thaw society in Zaporizhia. Ultimately, here's Bourdieu's big profound takeaway. Taste classifies and it classifies the classifier. He continues, social subjects classified by their classifications distinguish themselves by the distinctions they make between the beautiful and the ugly, the distinguished and the vulgar, in which their position in the objective classifications is expressed or betrayed. This is the big argument and I want to walk through that again. Taste classifies and it classifies the classifier. What that means is if you like something, it doesn't mean anything about that thing, right? No theater production or artwork or piece of music is objectively good or bad. Your attitude about it tells us a lot about you. 
Taste classifies. We classify things. Some things are good, some things are bad, some things are for this kind of people, some things are for this kind of people. That classification doesn't tell us anything about those cultural objects, but it sure tells us a lot about ourselves. Taste classifies, and it classifies the classifier. If I like Nordic Noir, it doesn't tell us anything about Nordic Noir, but it tells us a lot about me. It's not about classical music is better than jazz or rap or rock, but people who think so are certain kinds of people, right? We learn about someone by their tastes, by the kinds of music they like, by the kinds of um, books they read, whether they read, right? Um, by what they watch on TV. That tells us a lot about who people are. There's a wonderful moment by um, Yuri Shevelyov who writes that um, in the 1920s and 1930s, young people coming from the village to Kharkiv, the new capital of Soviet Ukraine, went to Kurbas's Berezil Theater, often because they were part of a factory or part of a school, um, but they did so because they wanted to fit in. Whether they liked a four-hour production at Kurbas's Berezil Theater is irrelevant. But the fact is there was this idea that going to that theater and going to the theater and being a part of this theater that was constantly in the press and constantly being discussed, that made you a Soviet person, right? That raised your status in society because you could talk about that show at the Berezil, which some people liked and some people hated. What is your taste, right? Your taste determines your place in society. Okay, so now we're gonna move onwards to this slightly more complicated, the field of cultural production. This is a complicated text about how cultural production and reception changes and developing these ideas of cultural capital that we saw in distinction. And what makes this complicated, I think, is that Bourdieu is using the example of 19th century French literature beyond this excerpt, and essentially how Emile Zola, the writer, squared the circle by being a critical and a popular economic success. You don't need to know anything about French literature. We will not be discussing that, but we will be discussing the field because it's a really useful concept, particularly as we move forward in this course. So what is the field? He says very clearly, in other words, the field of cultural production is the site of struggles, struggles, in which what is at stake is the power to impose the dominant definition of the writer and therefore to delimit the population of those entitled to take part in the struggle to define the writer. What does that mean? Culture is a site of struggle. The field is a site of struggle. And that struggle is over who gets to be a writer. Who gets to be a writer? And who gets to determine who gets to be a writer? And the issue here is that there's a difference between critical and popular success, right? That um, you can think about it in your own culture in the United States. We might say, for example, that Stephen King with his horror novels or John Grisham with his yearly novels about some lawyer doing something about social justice in the American South are not real writers, right? They're popular writers. Their books are on Audible, right? Um, they're not real writers. Um, so there's this sort of distinction between people who make a lot of money doing their art can't possibly be a critical success. Right? Um, you might think what that, what that is, I mean, in, in, in Ukraine, sort of what comes to my mind is Serhii Jadan, who squares this circle, right? He's sort of a, a he seems to be a very popular and, and successful writer. He's very popular um, abroad, but he's also sort of critically successful. So you might think about different writers or different cultural figures. Are they critically successful? Are they popular? Are there people who square the circle? Um, are there people who might um, belong somewhere in this field of cultural production. Is it bad to make money in order to be a critical success? Can art make money? What is good theater? Can a musical on Broadway be good theater? I had this discussion with students in Ukraine all the time. Can commercial theater be good? Can commercial theater be critically successful? Is the only critically good theater theater that doesn't make money? but then how do artists eat? What we think about artists and money tells us a lot about ourselves and our assumptions 
and our idea about this field of cultural production, who gets to be an artist. So I'd like to bring in this very um, Bourdieu term, habitus. It's a very complex term in Bourdieu that basically means how you move through the world or the rules of the game. So an artist has a position and is somewhere on the field of cultural production. There's actually a chart on page 104 in your text. If you've got the text, you can look at that chart and kind of follow along with what I'm saying. So an artist has a position, some kind of position with some money or not, position with the critics or not, and is somewhere on the field of cultural production. And there's a, what Bourdieu calls a space of possibles, kind of phrase I love, the space of possibles, depending on various factors. The artist has a habitus, a sense of what she can do and how leading to a disposition, a movement in some direction on the field. I always imagine this like a chessboard, right? So you've got a chessboard and every artist is like on the chessboard somewhere and you can move in certain directions depending on the rules of the game, right? And for Bourdieu, he's talking about the rules of the game in 19th century French literature, right? Where you had poets with consumption starving in attics and then people making a lot of money in the boulevard melodrama, right? Um, the field of cultural production is gonna be different in different places. You need to think about what are the axes where you are, right? But the idea is that artists are somewhere on this field trying to be an artist. And there are certain things determining what they can do. And how artists get cultural capital is by moving in this field. And so what's really interesting to think about is what happens when we destroy the field? Can we destroy the field? How do we invent new rules of the game? So this is something we'll talk about um, next time when we talk about networks that in some ways one way to think about revolution or radical change in the arts is to think about changing the chessboard right do you just change pieces of the board or do you like destroy the board itself what become the new markers of success what become the new markers of validity and what's really interesting about thinking about that with Bourdieu is that Bourdieu is writing in a Western context. He's writing in a context of capitalism where there's a market, right? So what about where there's no market? When whether it makes money is not an issue. I can tell you from reading a lot of documents about Soviet theater, very few Soviet theaters made money. They get to the end of the year and they're completely, you know, broke and losing money, and yet somehow they get another handout from the state, and there they are making a new set of productions. It's not about how much money you make. It's about something else. What is that something else? What is the market? If the market isn't about money, right? If it's not about supply and demand, what is the market about? Because there is one. There is a field of cultural production. We just need to determine what the axes are. What do you do when there's no market? What are the factors? There's always hierarchy, there's always struggle, but over different things. And so ultimately this field of cultural production offers us a different way of looking at power. The word power is not even mentioned really in this text. It's different from Foucault. It's not about someone suddenly becoming famous, but about maneuvering between commercial and popular and elite culture, seeing everything as part of one field. Let's move quickly to our primary source. This is another interview from the Center for Urban History, Oral History Collections. And um, the background to this source is, in the Soviet Union, people didn't really just go to the theater, right? You didn't say, oh, it's Sunday. I just had brunch. I think I'll go see a show. You didn't just look at a list of shows and think about what you wanted to see. Audiences were organized. And they were largely organized by the Bors, the Bureau of Organizing Spectators, literally. And these are people whose job it was to sell tickets. And they sold tickets through distribution to ticket kiosks throughout cities and through selling chunks of tickets to factories, schools, groups. So a show's success actually depends on the bores. 
and their ability to sell the show. And again, I can tell you from reading a lot of documents, this was a big site of contention in Soviet theaters, right? We don't like our boards, right? They're not doing a good job. They're not selling enough tickets. They're selling to the wrong people. They're giving too many tickets to this one kiosk. Uh, for a long time, I wondered why one of the theaters that I'm working on performed so much um, in, a, in a town called Morshchen. I couldn't figure it out. Um, and finally, someone explained to me that, oh, the Boers must have had some local relationship there, right? Enjoyed going to Morshchen, hanging out, selling a lot of tickets, and that meant that the theater was always performing in Morshchen, right? So read this source. Again, I always suggest reading sources aloud. This one isn't long. And this is a woman talking about how she sold tickets, how she made it work in the Soviet period in Lviv. So once you've read it, where's her taste? What do we learn about her taste? How does she know her taste? How does she know what audiences want? How does she know the audience's taste? She mentions that she knows her Ukrainian spectator, right? And how the theater is coming to the Russian theater uh, in Lviv, and I think by that she means Prikvor, the theater of the Carpathian military district. They need her help because she knows the spectators. Um, how does she know who should get the tickets? It really means, how does she know the taste? How does she know spectators' taste, right? And there's so many complaints about the Boers. Really, those complaints are about their taste. They didn't understand the show, so they didn't sell it well. They didn't understand the show, so they couldn't sell it well. So we immediately see this cultural hierarchy between the people making the theater, right, and the people selling the show. So even though we're not in a capitalist market, we see a market, right? We see these ideas of taste and cultural hierarchy that determine who is in the audience and who gets to see the show. What is theater? What is a theater artist? Who gets to determine that? We actually see that through this little primary source about the Bureau for Organizing Spectators and the people who worked there. So the takeaway for today is that taste is constructed. There is no objective good art and bad art. It's all subjective and it's a product of its time, of people determining those hierarchies and those categories. We can reflect back on our previous primary sources. Think about that actor talking about Zvanya. How are titles determined? Is there an objective taste for what is a good actor? No. As we know from state documents, those titles are wrangled and negotiated at all levels, right? It's not objective. Think about the journalist mentioning those cafes and those names. He's assuming that the interviewer and listener know the code. That is, they know these names and these places and they will be impressed. Taste classifies and it classifies the classifier. So now you have taste and you have cultural capital in your toolbox. And I urge you to think about your assumptions on what is good art, what is bad art, and who gets to be an artist, and what those, the answers to those questions will tell you about yourselves and your own culture. Thank you.